If you're joining us for the first time, if you're jumping in for the first time on a Sunday morning here, we find ourselves in week six of a series out of the book of Philippians called Live in Light. And in a basic sense, uh, a summary statement for that series is we are trying to align ourselves as people to live in light of Jesus' finished work. And we believe that Philippians is a book that, that shows us how to do that. If you've fallen behind, you've been tracking with us and you've missed a week here or there, Feel free to catch up on our website, tune into our podcast. You can find us at www.severn.cc. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off last week in chapter 2. We'll be taking a peek at verses 19 through 30. And to get us started, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. So um, the person writing this letter to the church at Philippi is a gentleman by the name of Paul. He's facing an extreme challenge at this point in his life. Uh, the man finds himself at this point in time in prison. He's been beaten up. He's been hated. He's been despised. He's been absolutely opposed. And so he's amidst a really difficult scenario and we can assume that because of the scenario that Paul finds himself amidst, he may be on the fence about you know, throwing in the towel, giving in, settling into to, uh, apathy or lethargy. Because Paul, he's pulled a lot of weight in his day. He's done a lot for the mission of Jesus. And, and this could have been his time to just say, hey, I'm in prison. I'm going to cruise control it out until my end of days, and I'm going to do me for a season. But, but the thing about Paul is he's a leader, and he's committed, and so he doesn't give up. He continues contributing to Jesus' mission through to the end, even from a prison cell. And here he's writing to the church at Philippi, that also finds themselves amidst a season where they're, they're really just tempted to give up. They're, they're losing sight of Jesus' mission uh, to serve Jesus and to serve others. They're losing sight of that as well. They're falling into some grumbling and complaining. There's a bit of division in their camp. And uh, we talked a little bit about that in verses 12 through 18 last week. And there's a real important principle that we can glean from that passage. And it's this, um, that you can't go around proclaiming the gospel of glorious grace, lavishing people with love while you're bitter, dissatisfied, and complaining. The two, in, the, the two just don't go together. They're kind of like oil and water, and they just don't mix. So the backdrop we have here is Paul's awaiting ultimately a verdict. His life is hanging in the balance, and instead of giving up, instead of grumbling and complaining, instead of becoming bitter and dissatisfied, Paul continues in the mission that he's on, pastoring his church, pastoring the church that's under his care at Philippi, because Paul, who's been radically changed by Jesus, was always ready to give the best that he had for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of people. And this particular way of life that we see in Paul, it's not something that Paul invented um, it's something that we see in the opening verses of chapter 2, where, we, where Paul paints us this beautiful picture, this deep, reverent picture of Jesus. Uh, Jesus who risked everything, who gave everything, who sacrificed everything, who in dying so that we could live, made visible God's deep, never-ending, never-failing love for people. And so that same Jesus that was at work, uh, it, that same Jesus that he paints a picture of is actually at work in Paul. And that's why Paul can, from the confines of prison, while on death row, continue in the work that he's been called to carry out. He can continue pastoring his friends at Philippi because basically, people, what Paul is doing is he's living out of the identity that Jesus has given him. He's not defined by his circumstances, but what's happening through his circumstances is Paul is actually becoming more like Jesus. Um, and in a basic sense, I'll give you a real quick outline of chapter two. It starts with what a picture, a real picture, a solid picture. And if you haven't read it, I'd advise you to just, just spend some time there. The beginning, beginning verses of chapter two starts with the grand picture of what Jesus has done. And then it ends with a picture of what it looks like to follow Jesus as contributors to, to the mission rather than consumers of the byproducts of the mission. So like Paul, uh, we're going to learn about two gentlemen, one by the name of Timothy, one by the name of Epaphroditus. Um, we're going we're to see that they're willing, like Paul, to give everything they have for the sake 
of following Jesus and for the sake of people. And what I hope we see in Paul, what I hope we see in Timothy, what I hope we see in Epaphroditus is, is simply this, that first and foremost, Jesus' work for us is absolutely finished. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing we can take away from it. And second to that, Jesus' work in us and through us is carried out as we respond to what Jesus has done as contributors to Jesus' mission. So simply stated, we're responding to what Jesus has done by making available our time, our talents, our efforts, our resources, and our lives to further Jesus' mission and to benefit the people around us. So the first point that I'd really like to spend some time arguing this morning or convincing you of this morning is that Jesus' followers are simply contributors. They're, Jesus' followers are contributors. So here we are, we find ourselves in chapter two, verse 19, and what we read there is, now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I also may be encouraged when I hear news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son and a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am convinced in the Lord that I myself will also come quickly. So these verses, verses 19 through 24, they, they, they function as a sort of window into the heart of Paul, uh, Paul's relationship with Timothy. He's Timothy's mentor. Uh, he's the guy that introduced Timothy to Jesus. And so uh, Paul, Paul has this affection for, for Timothy to the degree that he loves him like a son. In addition to, to what we see between Paul and Timothy, we see Paul's deep affection for the church at Philippi, for his Christian friends. And he sees them as worthy of the best that he has to contribute, the best that he has to offer. He regards them as more important than he regards himself. And this comes despite the fact that he's at a place where it would have been extremely easy to look around, see prison walls, see prison bars, and decide, I'm gonna retain the best that I have. I'm gonna reserve it for myself for this season. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look out for my own interests, my own well-being, and in essence, I'm just going to do me for right now because my life's really hard. But instead, Paul continues to see his friends at Philippi as the best, as worthy of the best he has to offer, and namely, what we're speaking of there is, is Timothy. Uh, and, and again, the, Timothy loves Paul like he loves no one else. Timothy occupies the, the central grounds in Paul's affections in a way that no other person um, even came close as far as we learn from, from what we read in the, in the Bible. And so like Paul, Timothy possesses a genuine care for others. And in verse 20, we hear Paul say, for I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. So Paul here, he, he's saying, this Timothy, he's the real deal. He, he's legit. Uh, he's authentic and there's nothing ulterior in his motivation. And he's downright committed to the welfare of people at all costs. He's willing to contribute anything for people because Timothy has a deep sense that Jesus has, contrib has already contributed everything for people. Timothy's willing to give sacrificially. He's willing to be vulnerable. He's willing to do whatever it takes to simply serve others, to engage uh, in, in Jesus' mission. And, and if I had to summarize Timothy's life, I'd summarize it like this. Jesus risked everything, so Timothy can risk everything. Jesus is Timothy's priority. Jesus' mission is Timothy's purpose. Jesus' aim is Timothy's aim. And Timothy doesn't just go around talking about the gospel or talking about Jesus. Uh, he doesn't do that at all. He accepts its total claim on his life and he responds by contributing his time, his resources, his efforts, and his life for the sake of Jesus and for the welfare of people. So for Timothy, it's basically this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And in that, in that mentality, 
Timothy is able to function as a contributor to Jesus' mission to rescue and restore people broken by sin. So if we continue reading uh, through this passage, we're going to run into another individual who I would consider a contributor as well. And he, he goes by the name of Epaphroditus. And in verse 25, we read, But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have one grief on top of another. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice when you see him again, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. So here's a little bit of context for you uh, to help you understand what Paul is referencing. Paul's been gone for about four years at this point in time. He's some 800 miles removed from the church at Philippi. Uh, that distance, in order to, to traverse that great a distance then would have taken about six weeks. And uh, the church at Philippi, when they became aware of, of, of Paul's circumstance, of Paul's scenario, they responded, and they responded by commissioning Epaphroditus to take a journey to Paul, to bring a love offering to Paul, to communicate to Paul that they, they cared for him, they were pulling for him, they were in his corner, despite being far removed from where he was at. So Epaphroditus sets out on this mission, and along the way, he gets extremely sick. And some commentators suggest to us that he was sick for some three months, and then we read point blank in the Bible that he almost died. So what happens is God ends up allowing Epaphroditus to get well. He keeps him alive, and Epaphroditus eventually gets up. And what I love about this guy, and, and this is really like the only picture we have of him, is he doesn't do an about face and march back to Philippi and say, you know what, I tried really hard. I got about halfway there. I got sick, had to tap out, and here I am, I'm back. Sorry, guys, I couldn't complete the mission. He doesn't do that at all. This guy's this guy steadfast in his following of Jesus. He's determined to carry out his mission. He's determined to see Paul. And the reason he's determined is because Jesus has empowered Epaphroditus to engage in Jesus' mission. And he's also empowered Epaphroditus to care more about people than he cares about himself. And so he trudges along, makes his way to Paul. Eventually, Paul sends him back to Philippi. And, and my friends, this is the letter we're reading right now, the one that he carried from prison to, Paul, to, uh, to Philippi. And so if we take, you remove Epaphroditus from the equation, we're down a book in the Bible. We don't have this letter. We don't learn about this experience. It's kind of crazy to wrap your mind around that, but that's the labor of love that's impacting us some 2,000 years later that we're reading about, that Paul's telling us about as we cruise through this letter. So what we see in Timothy and Epaphroditus uh, is this commitment to contribute everything they have to the benefit of others. Um, frankly, it's something that we, you and I, uh, people that are alive today, have a real hard time with. And Paul mentions this in verse 21 when he says, all seek their own interests. And so uh, I don't know about you, but, I, but I'm well aware of this. We're, well, we're immersed in a culture that, that has this high value of self-esteem Everybody gets a trophy, and, uh, and the mantra is that you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. All you have to do is believe. And um, in case you haven't noticed, I'd like to just clarify. I, I'm, I'm enormous. I'm huge. Um, I mean, look at me. <laughs> I mean, I'll wait longer if you want to look longer. But I'm really big, and because I'm so big— there are a few things that are just out of my reach. Like I just can't do them because I'm so huge. And one of those is um, the old top shelf. I can't, I can't really reach it. So regardless of how, how much I believe that I'm big, like I'm just not, okay? I'm just, I'm gonna level with you. I'm not. There's a ton of stuff I can't do. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll, just, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. It doesn't really 
work out. And, but, but here's the thing. Here's, here's where we've taken this in, in, in our culture here in, uh, in the United States of America. And, and we hear this from, from the consensus that we get from sociologists. And what they're trying to convince us of in this day and age is that a, a solid self-regard, meaning a high self-esteem, this is what it will produce. And it actually can function as a predictor for the way that we're going to live our lives. And the predictions they believe we can make based on a, on a healthy self-esteem, as they would call it, is that we're well-adjusted. So high self-esteem equals I'm well-adjusted, I'm clean, I'm sober, I don't do drugs, uh, I'm morally upright, I'm basically lucid, I don't have any inclination or any evidence of a criminal record, and uh, I probably have some sort of cum laude under my, my, real highly, my, my real high belt. You tracking with me? So basically, high self-esteem equals really good outcomes in, in, in your human experience, okay? Uh, that's a far cry from what was going on up to the 20th century as far as what we understood about self-esteem. Up to the 20th century, we believed something markedly different. And it was simply this, that a high self-regard, uh, and, and we can call that pride, is, it was the culprit, the catalyst, the reason behind criminal behavior, the reason behind poor decision-making, the reason why husbands beat their wives, the reason why people engaged in, in, in drinking and drug use and the like. And so what sociologists are saying is that people who struggle with low self-esteem, who have inner shame, they must be single moms. Uh, they're prone to social deviance. And if they don't drink, it's, it's because they use hardcore drugs. So we're, we're talking about a paradigm swing that, uh, in other words, it's a complete shift from our traditional cultural spec perspective to where we are right now in the 21st century. And it's all around the idea of self-esteem as the catalyst for either positive or negative outcomes in our human lives. And so, um, just, just plainly going to say this, there you have it. We've solved all the problems in the world. And it hinges on self-esteem. All we have to do, friends, all you have to do is go around boosting everyone's self-esteem. Like yourself more. Hold your, you know, hold a high perspective with regards to your, to your activities and the things that you engage in. And, and, and there you have it. Life will vastly improve for you. It's going to improve for everybody. That's, that's all we have to do. I, I'm, I hope you know that I'm joking when I say that. And if you didn't know that I'm joking, I'm joking. Like I'm clearly joking. Because here's the thing. If we boil this thing down, what we're looking at is what I'm calling an ego focus. And it's problematic because what an ego focus does is it produces consumers. Because ego focused individuals, they tend to exclude others unless they can somehow reap some benefit or reward from including them. Uh, they're focused on their own individual awareness, experience, and expression. And uh, consumers have a real struggle. Ego focused people have a real struggle to contribute anything to anyone other than themselves or their own initiatives. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that an ego focus produces a consumeristic drive that then translates to using things and people to craft an identity. And the ego focused person has one speed and it's always at full throttle and it's simply consume, consume, consume. And that's a dangerous place to be because the problem with that is it's debilitating and exhausting all at the same time. At the end of the day, when all has been consumed, when all has been attained, when everything's been achieved, one thing's gonna, gonna remain that, that no level of accomplishment or rapport in your community is gonna solve, and that's this feeling of absolute emptiness. Because the raw truth is this, that material things, no matter what they are, have no power in meeting spiritual needs. Material things cannot fulfill our absolute need for a connection first and foremost with Jesus and secondly with that which Jesus loves and we're talking about people there. And so the paradigm that a high view of self 
an ego focus is somehow the answer to, to human flourishing or us having better lives is antithetical. It's the total opposite of what we see at work in Paul, what we see at work in Timothy, and what we see at work in Epaphroditus. You see, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus aren't ego focused, they're other focused. They're focused on the needs and interests of others. They exhibit things such as empathy. They seek unity. They seek harmony. And their daily lives consist of them aligning their efforts and their actions to the, to the benefit of others and to the mission of Jesus. Because other focused people... They're willing, they're willing to do things that ego-focused people aren't. They're willing to contribute without receiving any immediate return. They're willing to take risk without getting any payback. And their other focus, let me tell you where it comes from, because it certainly doesn't come from the idea of an elevated self-esteem, as sociologists would, would attempt to convince us. It stems from, from nothing more than their absolute dependence on Jesus. And from their dependence on Jesus, what happens is uh, something emerges, and it's, a general, it's, it's genuine interest in that which Jesus values. And if Jesus values people, what we see is Paul Timothy and Epaphroditus valuing people. If Jesus values people, what we should see, what we should value is people. But here's the catch. Here's the catch. And, and we're all people. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm looking at a bunch of people. Um, some of us are just downright difficult to get along with. Can I, can I get an amen? Can I get a, can I get a yeah, a head nod, a yup, yup. And, and uh, some of you going, yup, yup, that, like that, you're, you're that person for somebody else, just throwing that out there. Just, just want to throw that out there. Um, and we're, we're difficult to live with. And then sometimes we have a hard time getting along with people, uh, meeting people where they are, because frankly, they don't fit in our frame of reference or our category for how people should behave. Uh, their homes aren't as clean as we, we expect them to be. Their children aren't as well-mannered as we would expect them to be. Their language is crass. Their neighborhood is less than ideal. And, and their social status is somewhere below par. And, and, and the thing is, we don't always love one another. We're not always readily acknowledging the fact that we're comrades uh, bonded together by the finished work of Jesus. Each of us purchased by the same Ransom, And uh, so we're prone to look at each other with suspicion. You know, I look at people and we get real suspicious. We don't trust them. And then there are some people that we just would rather not even be around. And uh, at times, there are those people that we feel threatened by because they have a gift that God's bestowed on them or given them. And we find some level of, of threat as a result of that. Um, and this is all because we have what I'm calling an egocentric default and, it, and it's all geared towards self-advancement and it gets in the way of Jesus calling on our lives to hold nothing back, bet the farm and unleash the best that we have, risking everything because Jesus gave everything. Um, so here's a question. How do, we, like, how do we get over that? How do we do this? How do we look beyond what we see in others? How do we look beyond even what we see in ourselves? Uh, how do we get beyond the, the idea of ego and consumerism, which is the default of the human heart? And how do we fully engage the way that Timothy, the way that Paul, the way that Epaphroditus engaged? And uh, the next point that I'd like to argue is what I believe is the catalyst for being a contributor. It's, it's the catalyst for overcoming the default of the human heart. And it's simply this, that our identity is not defined by our contribution. And maybe you hear, maybe in, in light of the first point that I made, that Jesus followers, our contributors, we're supposed to bring something to the table. We're supposed to give, you know, what we have to the benefit of others. Maybe this sounds counterintuitive, but if we're going to be like Paul, if we're going to be like Timothy, if we're going to be like Epaphroditus, I think it's hugely important that we understand what they understood about identity. Because you see, if our default as humans is to build our identity around something or someone other than the finished work of Jesus, um, that something or someone could be anything. I mean, it, you name it, it could be anything. It could be success. It could be the fear of failure. It could be an inferiority complex. It could be social acceptance, wealth, 
moral uprightness, spiritual pride. I mean, you name it. It could even be what you're actually contributing to the mission of Jesus. Because here's the thing, as, as human beings, we do a really good job of zeroing in on anything and everything. We elevate it, we worship it, we make it our purpose, and we, we end up building our identity around it. So I'll simply say this. If your identity is on anything other than Jesus, the result of your efforts are gonna do nothing else than leave you exhausted and empty at the end of your days. You're gonna be tired and you're gonna be worn out and you're gonna have nothing. You're not gonna feel elevated by your accolades anymore. You're gonna be ready to tap out because you got nothing else that you can physically accomplish. And um, we see a real picture in this in an excerpt from, uh, from an article that was found in Vogue magazine. I do not read Vogue magazine, um, so you can stop judging me now. Um, and this interview took place with um, Madonna. If you're familiar with Madonna, good for you. If you're not, good for you, even better. Um, but here's what she says. She says, my drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. That is always pushing me. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being, but then I feel I am still mediocre and uninteresting unless I do something else. Because even though I have become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and I guess it never will. So I'm not advocating that you buy Vogue magazine and look for really cool articles or that you adopt Madonna as your life coach. But what I am, what I am suggesting is that she has a, a deep sense and awareness of our ongoing struggle as human beings to find a sense of self, to experience a sense of self-worth, to be assured that we're cared for, that we're loved, that we're valued, and that we're appreciated. Madonna is plainly stating the fact that our deepest need cannot be met by our greatest contribution or accomplishment. It doesn't matter how impressive that may seem or may be, uh, whether in your eyes or the eyes of society or the community that you're a part of. And, and then, so that begs the question, if, if we can't, like if our, if, if, our, if, our, if our acts can't really move us forward in our relationship with God, like why? Why is this the case? And I think it's simply this. It's because of our ego focus, our consumeristic drive for more, to, to get more, to accomplish more. What we see in, in Madonna's interview, it's insatiable, meaning it can't be satisfied. It's a black hole and we can fill it up with people. We can fill it up with accolades. We can fill it up with things, with possessions, and, and, and it never adds up. It never will. And this is what I believe Paul is, is addressing with his friends at Corinth, if we, look at, um, if we look at verses three and four in his first letter to the Corinthians, right in chapter four, this is what Paul says. It is of little importance to me that I should be evaluated by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even evaluate myself. For I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I am not justified by this. The one who evaluates me is the Lord. So at first glance, we might perceive Paul to be uh, as egocentric as they come. He is just blatantly saying to, to the church at Corinth, guess what, guys? I don't care what you think. And then he takes it one step further, and he says, I don't even care what anybody thinks. But, but Paul was on a mission to, to teach a lesson there, and what he wanted the, the church at Corinth to understand was the difference that the gospel makes and how the gospel had transformed Paul, this high-level guy in society, this accomplishment-oriented guy in society, how the gospel had transformed his sense of self-worth, his sense of self-regard, and his identity. And Paul wants them to know one thing, and that one thing is this. Uh, it, it's the verdict regarding their identity meaning it's the final opinion regarding their identity. And, and the catch here is it's not a verdict, it's not an opinion based on their performance or anything they've ever contributed or will contribute. It's a verdict based solely on the finished work of Jesus. It's based on Jesus' sinless performance. It's based on Jesus' perfect contribution. And so in the beginning of verse three, what we read there is, it's of little importance to me that I should be evaluated by you or any human court. And, and what we see there, we could assume Paul's trying to lay the groundwork for an approach to identity development. 
that's, that's consistent with what you might hear from a counselor who is basically just encouraging us to set our own standards for living. You know, the counselor's saying, hey, you know what? It really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Table all that, put that off to the side, zero in on what you think about yourself and move forward on that. And at, at a surface level, Setting our own standards sounds really, really awesome. It sounds like a prime opportunity to design a life that we can thrive in, to design a context of living in which we're gonna be successful. Um, but it is not the solution. It's more of a trap than anything else because boosting our self-esteem by living up to our own standards is not really gonna get us anywhere. And here's how I know this. Um, I'm a human being, right? You guys can see that. I was born and I have a mom and a dad. Right, like most of you, I'm sure you have a mom and a dad and you have somewhat of a relationship with them. And, and based on that relationship, they came up with standards for living, right? Those were called the rules of your home. You know, one of the rules in my home was like they were anti-tattoo. And when I came home with a tattoo, it was like, whoa, mom, <laughs> I didn't know you could be that angry. But at any rate, you know where I'm going with this. I lived up to absolutely every one of their standards. Like I totally complied, hit the mark, it was like a perfect childhood. If they were here today, they'd probably, they'd be clapping at this moment, but they're not. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it was quite the contrary. I did, I did a really poor job in living up to their standards and, and frankly could not. So then, so, so then we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as a context. We have a hard time living up to our parents' standards. I think we would all agree. Am I wrong? Okay, you probably, you probably have specific things you're thinking about. So I can, I can move from mom and pop's living room where they're saying, yeah, don't do this and you can do that to, to the people around me outside of my home. Those are my friends, my, my classmates, uh, the guys on my ball team, you name it. They had standards for living as well. And, um, and again, I'm falling short. I don't live up to their standards for how I'm supposed to act, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to say, what I'm supposed to engage in, what I'm supposed to avoid. So I fail, I fail in my family, I fail in my, in my peer group. Then I zoom out and I'm like, well, what about society's standards? Maybe I can live up to that somehow. And I played the game. You know, I uh, went to college, got a, got a degree or two, um, went to a private high school, played sports in college, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, I'm still missing the mark on standards. I'm still not living up to the standards that society had set forth. So my other option is this. I am failing at living up to everyone's standards. I'm just gonna live up to my own. I'm gonna build my own standards and boom, I'm gonna nail it every time. Well, guess what? If, if you've tried this, you know what I'm talking about. Sorry. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. It doesn't pan out the way that we envision it to pan out because we can't even live up to our own standards. And in each case, we are left feeling terrible, feeling miserable, feeling like an absolute failure. So we have a, a, another option that exists. So we take the bar from up here and we're like, well, maybe my standards are too high. So then I lower them. And then all I become is the guy with really low standards, which is a really, I mean, that, that'll get you applause. People love that. When your standards are so low that they don't even mean anything anymore. And again, I'm left feeling absolutely terrible feeling like a failure. But what Paul is communicating at the end of, of verse three here and through verse four, when he says, in fact, I don't even evaluate myself for I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I am not justified by this. The one who evaluates me is the Lord. What he is saying is that Jesus is the only one capable of providing an accurate evaluation of who we are. And he knows that Jesus is the only true source of validation and acceptance. And ultimately what Paul is looking for, what Timothy is looking for, what Epaphroditus is looking for, what Madonna is looking for, what you and I are searching for is the ultimate verdict that will somehow assure us that we're valued, we're loved, and we're accepted. And we, we go around, we're constantly on the lookout for this final consensus about our identity. We look for it in the people that we hang around. We look for it in the, in the, in the things that we engage in. And on a daily basis, this makes us tired because what happens is we find ourselves amidst a proverbial courtroom. We're in the courtroom day in and day out seeking this verdict based on our performance. And the unfortunate part about this is on some days, the days when I feel like I'm winning, when I'm doing the right things, when I'm engaged in the, in the right behaviors, I feel really good. But then I compare that to the days where I just totally miss the mark. And again, I'm back, I'm back to square one. I'm a failure 
all over again. This is exhausting. It's an exhausting place to live. It's an exhausting place to be trying to perform to earn a verdict that frankly we cannot earn. So what Paul is saying is that the verdict is in. He's saying the one who evaluates me is not in this room. The one who evaluates me is Jesus. Jesus' opinion is the only one that counts when it comes to our identity. And here's why the gospel absolutely shatters our ideas about justice. Because unlike other worldviews where performance, what we do or what we fail to do, leads to a verdict of either guilty or not guilty, the gospel gives us the verdict before the performance. And what I mean there is with Jesus, it's not our performance. It's not what we do or fail to do that leads to the verdict. The verdict is already in. And the verdict, that not guilty verdict that we find in the person and work of Jesus is what leads to performance. You see, Paul's identity is established so deeply in Jesus that he doesn't even consider his own thoughts validating. The only verdict about his identity that he is concerned with is the one that Jesus delivered. And the moment that Paul believed, the moment that Timothy and Epaphroditus believed, the moment that you and I believed, God said, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. We have an additional level of assurance in this if we turn to Romans chapter eight, verse one, where we read, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, at the moment We believe God sees us as righteous because of Jesus' perfect performance. As if it were our performance, as if our performance were perfect. He adopts us into his family and we are fully accepted as his own. So as the worship team comes up this morning, I want you to hear this. If you're here today, and you're like, man, this is, this is brand spanking new. I've never really even thought about it like that. Or maybe you're sitting in a chair and you're just thinking, you know, it'd be really cool if I could believe that. Like, I really want to believe that, but, but I just can't. Uh, hear this, that there are a ton of people out there, um, self-included at times, who really struggle to understand uh, Christian identity versus other types of identity. It's a real struggle. And, and the, the struggle is simply hinged on this, that Christian identity, it operates totally differently from any other kind of identity that we might be familiar with. Christian identity, uh, it's just, it's in a category of its own. It shatters the categories. It's just other. And when you compare it to atheistic or, or Muslim or Buddhist or religious or irreligious approaches to how we understand ourselves, It just blows those out of the water because Christianity is not about what you've done. It's not about what you're going to do. It's not about what you've accomplished. It's it's all about what Jesus has fully and finally accomplished. Because here's the thing, Jesus, Jesus is saying to us, the trial is over. And it's not just over, Jesus is saying, I stood the trial for you. And you're able to walk out of the courtroom cleared of all your guilt, of all your shame, of all your, all your failures. Friends, with every other form of identity, it's always a case of the verdict coming from our performance. But with Jesus, the verdict is in. And now we can perform on the basis of that. We can function as contributors because Jesus fully loves and accepts us because Jesus went on trial for us. Jesus entered the courtroom on our behalf. He was on trial. He didn't deserve to be there, yet he didn't complain. He was silent. He was struck. He was beaten. And he didn't even defend himself. And the reason he didn't defend himself is because he was defending us. He was defending us. He took the guilty verdict that we deserved. He faced the trial that should be ours so that we would never have to stand trial. Because of Jesus' finished work, we are fully accepted. And our identity is established in Jesus' perfect performance, Jesus' righteousness. Hear this, people. We're free to stop trying to build a resume to gain his acceptance.
We can stop doing things for the purpose of building a reputation and instead we're free to function as contributors for the joy that comes with contributing to Jesus' mission. The joy that comes with meeting people where they are and having their, their well-being and their interests at heart. And you know what? You might be, uh, you might be sitting here thinking, <laughs> What do I have to offer? What do I have to contribute? Look at me, I'm broke as a joke. Don't have a job, don't have time. I don't have the things that Timothy, that Paul, that Epaphroditus were offering. Well, don't make it complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's simply this. Just be willing to unleash whatever you have whenever you have it. It's as simple as that. Because here's, here's, the, here's the trick to this. It's more about what motivates you than, than what you actually do. And friends, we're no longer motivated by trying to gain acceptance. We're motivated by having been fully accepted. Your motivation is the joy and the freedom to contribute whatever you have because you're fully accepted by Jesus. You're free to contribute everything you're ha you have, putting everything on the line, risking everything because Jesus gave everything. Ultimately, friends, you are free to live lives as contributors. That's all I have for you this morning.